Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We started studying the parable of the Good Samaritan in our last lesson. The setting for Jesus giving that parable was when an expert in the Mosaic Law, also called a lawyer or scribe, tested him in an effort to trip him up in some doctrinal error. Jesus answered the lawyer's question, which was on how he could inherit eternal life with a question of his own, which was on how the lawyer understood what the Word of God taught on the subject. The lawyer gave a good answer, but he didn't want to obey what the Word taught, and this caused him to make an excuse by asking Jesus, and who is my neighbor? A very simple explanation of the parable is that Jesus giving us the definition of neighbor and what it means to fulfill the command to love others as we want to be loved. We close our last lesson by taking a quick look at the man who was robbed, beaten, and left for dead, and then looked at the priest who passed by the man because he concluded that it was too costly to show him compassion. I'm not going to review all that we studied on the priest, but want to reiterate that the self-righteous man refused to show compassion to the waylaid man. Of course, he would have given all kinds of religious excuses why he didn't help the man, but they would have been all hollow excuses that exposed the corruption of his character. If the priest had been robbed, beaten, and left for dead, he would have welcomed anyone to quickly come to his aid. Yet what he wanted done to him, he wasn't willing to do for another. Everyone who heard the story of the priest who passed by the dying man would have verbally abused him for his selfishness. The priest not only failed to have compassion on the man, but he despised him, and this is seen by his passing by on the other side of the road. He didn't want to get anywhere near that kind of man. Once while preaching in the Southwest, I asked a pastor just before I got up to preach if there were any unsaved people in the service. He looked around the congregation and said no. I preached the message the Lord gave me and directed it towards believers. At the end of the message, I felt compelled to give a salvation altar call, and an old man responded. He was really broken over the life of sin that he had lived. After the service, the pastor confessed to me that he saw the man in service, but thought he was so hard-hearted that he wouldn't respond to the call of salvation. The pastor had written the man off since he had been in prior services and ministered to him on a personal basis. Yet there was the old man weeping at an altar of repentance over the sins he had committed. We have our own ways of doing what the priest did. And we also have our excuses why we don't show compassion to certain kinds of people or in certain situations. In verse 32, Jesus inserts a new dynamic into the story, stating, So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. The first thing we see is that the Levite was following behind the priest. We can only guess that he was near enough to see what the priest did. And this is an important point, as we will shortly see. Jesus said the Levite came to the place where the dying man was lying in a pool of blood. This means that he stopped to look at the man while the priest ignored him. He thought by following the example of his priest that he would be alleviated from any responsibility. Though the Levite passed by on the other side of the road, he stopped to see the man and the wounds that were inflicted upon him. I'm not sure which is the worst expression of selfishness and evil. The priest that passed by on the other side of the road and acted like the dying man didn't exist? or the Levite who stopped to look at the man and then walked by on the other side of the road. Both acts were thoroughly despicable and reveals a depth of depravity that defined these religious men, yet they were oblivious to the fact of their own corrupt character. Of the two religious men, I imagine the Levite was a little more sympathetic towards the man. But he made the choice not to help the man, so his sympathy was only an emotional response that produced no action. Sympathy and pity have the potential to blind us to our responsibility and deceive us into thinking that all we need is the right kind of emotion and we have done all that we could. To have sympathy and pity without sacrificial love only makes people more guilty before God. To recognize the needs of others but refuse to do anything about it is to make us culpable. The Levite may have even shed some tears over the dying man. He may have spoke some tender words to others and to his wife about what he saw and how terrible the world is getting. But he did absolutely nothing to help the man. He refused to get involved, and the response of the priest to the situation only reinforced his selfishness. 
If there would have been an offering taken to help such a man or establish a hospital to minister to people that had been beaten by robbers, then the Levite probably would have given some money and felt that he did a good deed. He would have then thought that he was justified in his actions and that he was a compassionate man giving some money to a supposedly good cause. I doubt if the priest would have given anything because he was a professional at making up excuses on why he couldn't get involved in meeting the needs of such terrible people. He may have even thought that the dying man had been judged by God for some evil he had done, so he got what he deserved. The priest is more guilty in this story because he set an example that the Levite followed. But the Levite is guilty because he followed the dreadful example of an ungodly religious man. For all practical purposes, the priest was a spiritual leader to the Levite. The Levite would have looked to the priest for guidance in spiritual matters since he was an expert in the law and sacrificial system. Since the priest passed by the ambushed man, the Levite followed his example. Both men made the choice that they did, and though the Levite followed the example of the priest, he made the choice to do so. If the Levite touched a dead man, he would have been declared unclean. The ceremonial cleansing for Levites was far less costly and time-consuming than it was for priests. With the greater call comes a greater responsibility. For the Levite to show the man compassion would have cost him time in helping the man, money for his recovery, and a bow to being ceremonially unclean that wasn't too big of a thing. Yet all this combined was too great of an obstacle for the Levite to be willing to help the poor man lying on the road. He thought it was easier to follow the example of the priest, or to use a more evangelical word, his pastor. Here again we have an expression that compassion was too costly, and he didn't want to pay the price. An interesting point in this story can only be understood if we put ourselves in the shoes or sandals of the common people of Israel of 2,000 years ago. If you asked them who was the holiest people in Israel, the people of the land would have said the priests and Levites. They would have considered them to be lovers of the nation and of the temple that was the pride of the people. Yet in this story, Jesus makes the priests and Levite more despicable than the bandits that beat, robbed, and left the man for dead. This would have had the people listening in astonishment. When we see who Jesus makes the hero of the story, then the people would have been dumbfounded by his parable. Now let's turn our attention to the hero and see what kind of man he is. Verse 33 introduces the man. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. Jesus made a Samaritan the hero, who was hated by the Jews, and Samaritans hated the Jews as well. This would be as radical an idea as if the parable had been given in our day, and the villains were Jewish rabbis and the hero a Palestinian. I guarantee that the people were shocked at what Jesus said, and I would include the disciples in this as well. We don't realize how radical Jesus is, because we have tamed down his preaching to make him acceptable to our lukewarm religion. Though we try to redefine the radical Jesus into a deity of our own making, he won't cooperate with us. He remains true to who he is and is the changeless God he has always been and will always be. If we don't see the radical Jesus throughout the Gospels, then we have been reading them through dark-colored glasses that have dumbed down what is revealed about the biblical Jesus. The Savior didn't break into our world to make us happy but to bring us to true salvation and make us holy so that we can live with him forever in the wonder of his glory. Since I have recently outlined the history of Samaritans, I won't go over that again. What I will say is that the Samaritans were a mixed breed of Israelites with pagans who created religion that the Jews considered heretical. In contrast, the Samaritans thought themselves to be the true descendants of Israel and preservers of the true faith. They considered that the temple in Jerusalem and Levitical priesthood were illegitimate and that the place of true worship was to be upon Mount Gerizim, where they claimed that Moses had originally intended the Israelites to worship. The Samaritans used a unique version of the five books of Moses and rejected the rest of the Jewish Old Testament writings. There's much more to the issue, but this is enough to see why the animosity existed between the two people groups. Since Jesus was speaking to a Jewish audience and directly to an expert in the Mosaic law that would have rejected the religion of the Samaritans, for Jesus to make a Samaritan the hero of the story was very radical. Since the people listening to Jesus would have thought that the man who was left for dead was a Jew, they would have expected Jews to help him, but they didn't. To their way of thinking, a Samaritan would never help a dying Jew. 
Yet here he is doing what the priests and Levites should have done, but failed to do for very selfish reasons. Of course, all the people in this parable are fictitious, but the point of the parable is made very powerful by the contrast between the people. Jesus painted the picture of the Samaritan as a wealthy man, probably a merchant, and we see this when a donkey is introduced into the story. Only rich men owned and rode donkeys. Poor people walked. When the Samaritan saw the naked, beaten, and bloody man, he came to where the man was. There's a progression in the story where the priests pass by on the other side of the road. The Levite came to the place and then passed by, but the Samaritan came to the man. The only right response was to come to the man. Anything else was the response of sin, selfishness, and pride. We are told that when the Samaritan saw him, he took pity on him. When you look at the definition of pity and sympathy, though they can include action, they can also be mere emotions. The King James Version translated the word as compassion, which I think is a better word to use to convey what Jesus said. Jesus is making compassion a concrete act of love, not mere emotion. This is what made the Samaritan different from the priest and Levite, both of whom may have felt some kind of pity, but had no concrete expression of genuine love. The key to this is that the Samaritan came to the place where the man was and saw him. He saw the real need and had a tender heart that could be moved beyond the mere emotion of pity to the action of compassion. Compassion produces action, and this is something we must allow God to create in us through divine grace. Natural compassion will only take a person so far into the needs of others. But God-given, God-developed compassion makes people act like Jesus, where love becomes selfless and sacrificial. Here we also find compassion coming from a very unlikely person and being given to another very unlikely person. We learn from this that every follower of Jesus can show compassion. It's not about how talented we are or the spiritual gifts we have, but whether we will selflessly love others. To show compassion to others, we must open our eyes to see the need, just like the Samaritan saw the man and responded with compassion. When we don't show compassion to others, it's either because our heart is hard, or we have become spiritually blind to the needs of others. The needs are everywhere. To meet the needs of the needy, we only have to open our eyes. The Samaritan was busy with his traveling, probably returning home after taking care of a business deal in Jerusalem. Maybe he was on his way to another business meeting. The point is that when he came upon the need, he responded with compassion. To show compassion, we must put ourselves in a place of vulnerability and allow our day to be messed up by meeting the needs of others. If we seek to save ourselves from the discomfort of showing compassion, then we are seeking to save our life, which is something Jesus has strictly forbidden us to do. Compassion is costly, but it's also worth the effort and the expense. To grow more like Jesus is to grow closer to Him, for one cannot happen without the other. Since He is the prize that every believer should be passionately seeking after, then as we grow in compassion, we will know God's tender mercies more fully in our life. When we have compassion on others, then the Lord will certainly have compassion on us. This isn't a work-based religion, but what comes out of a real relationship with the living God. In verses 34 and 35, we are shown six things that the Samaritan did to show compassion to a dying man. The verses read, He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. The first is where it all begins. We are told that he went to the man. The priest didn't directly look at the man, though he saw him clearly enough to make sure that he passed by on the other side of the road to get as far from him as possible. The Levite looked at him, hardened his heart against the man, and then passed by on the other side of the road as well. The Samaritan went to the man. It's going to the place of need that compassion can be awakened in our life. To live a safe, comfortable life is to live a selfish life, void of divine compassion working through us. After going to the man, the Samaritan saw the need and bandaged his wounds and pouring on oil and wine. By going to the man, he found that he was alive. Neither the priest or Levite would have become ceremonially unclean by coming to the man since he wasn't dead. Their next excuse could have been, well, what if he died while I was touching him? Then I would be unclean. 
To live by what-ifs is to live a life in fear and futility. It's to live a self-protective life of selfishness. We are called to obey God above everything, including our comfort, security, and religious rights. Compassion is proven by action, not mere words. The Samaritan saw the need and responded correctly to the need. He didn't lecture the dying man on not traveling alone or just offered some comforting words and then continued on his journey. He went to the man to help him at his point of need. In one sense, it would have been easier to bandage up the man that had been physically beaten than to bandage up his heart and mind that has been battered by sin, suffering, or worldliness. Bandage up the body and it will heal, for bodies know what to do with wounds and bruises. But it's not that easy with our spiritual, mental, and emotional life, for we can resist the God-ordained treatments even to our own demise. The remedy the Samaritan used was very common for the day. Wine was used to cleanse the wound and oil to soothe the pain and aid in healing. At times they were mingled together as a healing balm. Though the rich man was riding a donkey, which are beasts of burden, he wouldn't have been prepared to face such a situation. To bandage the man, the Samaritan would have needed to tear up some of his costly garments. I don't believe there's an allegorical meaning hiding within our Lord's use of oil and wine as a help to heal the man. Yet we need to use the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to bring people to spiritual healing. This can't truly be done through any secular means, for the problem is a sin issue that has produced a corrupt character. The only remedy to our sin-sick souls is Jesus, and the therapy He gives is Himself, the Word, and the Spirit, and this is more than enough to heal the deepest wounds inflicted upon anyone. All those who reject Christ's remedy will not find an answer to their spiritual cancer that's killing them. Only Jesus can save a sinner from his sin and subsequent damnation. The third thing the Samaritan did was to put the man on his own donkey. Here's how we know the man was rich, because he was riding a donkey. It wasn't enough to bind the man's wounds and then leave him in the desert region, since he would still die. Compassion demands that we do all that's within our ability to do, and then look to Christ for the grace to go further. There's a very important lesson here about compassion. The rich Samaritan was riding his donkey, To show compassion to the man who was near death, he would have to put him on his own donkey to take him to a safe place. Pride is a killer of compassion, because it keeps us from stooping down to minister to those in need. The moment the Samaritan put the man on his donkey, he took the place of servant. He had to lead the animal where he was to go, and so anyone passing by would think that the rich man was a servant and the dying man the master. Though the account doesn't say it, It's very reasonable to assume that the Samaritan took some of his costly clothes to cover the man's nakedness. This would all the more give the impression that the Samaritan was the servant. It's interesting to see how in this parable we have the opposite response from the historical account of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler wasn't willing to humble himself, but in the parable of the good Samaritan he did. The rich young ruler wasn't willing to part with his wealth, but the Samaritan did. The rich young ruler walked away from Jesus, but in the story of the Samaritan, he lived out the two greatest commands. The fourth thing the good Samaritan did was he took him to an inn. To this point, the hero of this story took care of the man's need, so the next thing was to give him adequate shelter. The merchant still needed to continue on to his desired destination, but he made a way for the man to be cared for until he could return to his home. From the sixth thing the Samaritan did, we know that he was looking out for the man beyond what was convenient. Nothing the merchant did for the man was convenient, since showing compassion is never convenient. The goal of the Samaritan was to help the man, and this meant that he had to go all the way unless somehow the dying man said no. Is this not the case with Jesus and how he deals with us? We were beaten up by the world and some angry devils and left for dead. Jesus came to our aid. But most people, even while they know that they are dying, drive Jesus away. The very one that can do them the most good, they reject hate and disdain. What sad, foolish people we can be. The Samaritan went even further than just leaving the dying man at an inn. For the rest of the day, and on through the night, he took care of the dying man. He gave up sleep to make sure that the man lived through the night. All the care and tenderness that a nurse could give, this rich man gave to the one who probably didn't even know who was taking care of him. The prejudice of some people can be so great that there's the distinct possibility if the dying man had known a Samaritan was taking care of him, 
he may have rejected that help. If he had, the Samaritan had done what the Lord expected of him. For the sake of the story, it seems like the man must have been in delirium or unconscious and didn't know who his benefactor was until a later date. The final thing the Samaritan did happened on the next day when he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. The rich man paid for the room and board for the first night for both of them. Then he left enough to take care of the man for a certain number of days. Not just that, the Samaritan told the innkeeper that if there were any more expenses, that when he returned, he would pay everything. My guess is that the inn was at or near Jericho and was a regular stopping place for the merchant. The Samaritan must have trusted the innkeeper enough to leave the man with him, and the innkeeper must have trusted the merchant to know that he would pay the bill upon his return. It would seem that this was an inn ran by Jews, since it was near or in Jericho. If this was the case, then there could be the distinct possibility that the innkeeper might take advantage of the Samaritan, yet the Samaritan was willing to be taken advantage of for the sake of the dying man. Compassion, which is true love in action, doesn't ask, how much will it cost me, but obeys the command of God to selflessly love others. I'm not saying this is easy, because most often it's not. God hasn't called us to easy. We are to obey no matter what the cost is, and we are to obey without grumbling and complaining. The compassion the Lord is commanding us to live out is beyond our natural ability, and that's why we must be strong in divine grace through dependency upon God and surrender to His will. Since the man that was robbed, beaten, and left for dead was probably Jewish, and his rescuer Samaritan, there was no real hope of reward, repayment, or even a thank you, since the Jewish prejudice against Samaritans was so great. There is a very important lesson here. Compassion and loving service can't be done if the motive behind the actions is to receive the praise of man. We are to serve others out of obedience to Christ, while not looking for their thanks and praise. This is harder to attain than what we might think, because our motives are tainted by our sin nature, and it takes a lot of dying to self to serve others selflessly. Now let's be honest here. How often do we help someone or serve in the church and are looking for some kind of reward? Have you ever gotten angry because you didn't feel appreciated for what you did in the church or to a friend or relative or even a stranger? Have you ever been angry at your pastor because he didn't greet you, so you felt slighted? Or maybe he didn't say thank you for helping in the church, so you accused him of being unloving? Think of the times you helped someone and felt used because there was no expression of thanks, or maybe you even felt walked upon. When the motives behind what we do for others is wrong, then we are bound to be hurt or angry over not getting what we think we deserve. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, we don't see one expression of helping another for some selfish gain, whether in the form of money, praise, or even thanks. He did what was right in God's eyes, and that was enough for him. There's another point I want to touch on, and this is very radical, but it takes understanding of the dynamics of Jewish culture of 2,000 years ago. We can look at the tensions in the Middle East and see the blood feuds that may have been going on for decades, even millenniums. There's severe animosity between nations and people groups, and those that surround Israel are very hostile to that little nation. Many would make it cease to exist if they could. Within the ancient Middle Eastern culture, there's the idea of a just kind of vengeance. At least some people think that their vengeance is just. Because of the perverted ideas of justice and vengeance that fills the hearts and minds of people, the Lord incorporated within the Mosaic Law the responsibilities and limitations of a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer is the nearest male relative who is given the responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who is in trouble, danger, or in need. Abraham was a kinsman redeemer for Lot, and this meant that Abraham had to go to war to rescue his nephew. Boaz is another example where he redeemed his dead relative's wife and property. Jesus is the perfect example of a kinsman redeemer, and this is beautifully portrayed in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. The Hebrew term for kinsman redeemer designates one who delivers, rescues, or redeems a relative or his property. Another responsibility of a kinsman redeemer was to institute justice when a relative was killed or murdered. In the case of accidentally killing a person, the guilty man could go to a city of refuge, and as long as he stayed in that city, the avenger blood couldn't legally take his life. For those who have intentionally murdered someone, the kinsman redeemer had the legal right to execute the guilty person anywhere, for there was no city of refuge for the murderer. The moment the Samaritan began to attend the dying man, he became responsible for his life. 
If at any point the man died while under his care, the Samaritan would become guilty of his death and would possibly become the target of a kinsman redeemer. Even if the man died at the inn, the fault would be laid on the shoulders of the Samaritan and he would face the wrath of the family. If the dying man was a Jew, there's a real possibility that if he died, they would enact the law of a kinsman redeemer and would think nothing of executing a Samaritan. We see from this the dangerous dimension that can be associated with living a life of compassion. To love others selflessly is costly, and for some the cost could be their life. Think of missionaries that are in hostile territory striving to bring some people to Christ. They could at any time be killed or kidnapped. Think of all those who have died for the cause of Christ through the history of the church, and did so gladly that some people might be saved and that Jesus was glorified. The Word of God doesn't teach that showing Christ's love to others would be easy, but that it's actually very costly. Why aren't we winning the world to Christ? Because we want a happy life. We don't want to suffer to show Christ's love to others. We don't want to be like the Good Samaritan. Jesus asked the lawyer in verse 36, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? A very simple question with an obvious answer. In the next verse, the expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. This is God's will for everyone that would be a genuine follower of Jesus. Go and do likewise. Live a life of sacrificial love that proves Jesus is alive in you. Yet this command would leave the lawyer hopeless in himself because he didn't have the power through himself to live this out. To go and do likewise can only be done through the true grace of God, which Jesus freely offers to all those who would bow to his rule over their life. Which one are you in this parable? The priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill, let healing walk.